We'll be flying to Rwanda, and the core team of the Connected Community will be back on June the 8th, and uh, Pastor Wally Fleming and I will be back on July the 2nd, and uh, we'll have a wonderful time. But this congregation has been so generous, and I want to thank you for that. Many of you have had a chance to sponsor children, and if you're still needing to do that, you can do that. I said something about that before. But through the gifts of the congregation, you have supported all of our uh, anticipated costs while we're there. In addition to that, you've given each of us a uh, a stipend toward our airfare, and so I want to thank you. It's very, very, very gracious, and so we, are, we appreciate that and look forward to, to serving there. Um, I'm wearing the wrong color stole today. It's supposed to be white for Trinity Sunday. Barb reminded me, um, but I was resistant because this is the one made by Joy Shuan that matches the one over here that's going to Rwanda to, for us to present as a gift to the pastor of our connected community in Rwanda. And also on that table, I want to, if you have a chance after worship to take a look at what's there, you'll see several things. You'll see some pictures. Some of you may remember uh, a few weeks ago, Leif Nielsen, the Chartel's son-in-law, was here taking photographs, and there's a little photo album that'll help that congregation get to know the people who happened to be here that Sunday, uh, because Leif got a lot of pictures of you. And then there's a group shot that'll be there for them and their church, and we plan to bring back a picture that we can place in our church as well. And then you'll also see on the table two handmade uh, stained glass crosses made by Dan Chartel, and one of those is going to be presented to the bishop and one to the pastor as a gift from our congregation. And then you'll also see the, the, in the center there the beautiful wood inlay made by Jeff Benedict, and that is going to be presented to the Ruru congregation. And there'll be one here in our congregation as well as a pair so that we can always look at that and remember our connected community in Rwanda. So with heartfelt gratitude, thank you for your participation in this important work that we are embarking upon. But here we are again. Every Sunday on the Sunday after Pentecost, it's Trinity Sunday. It's Trinity Sunday, and if you've been around a long time, you know that this rolls around every year on the Sunday after Pentecost. If you're new to Community of Savior, it may be a surprise to you that this is called Trinity Sunday. It's the, it's the prompting of the church every year on this day to bask in the wonder of the Trinity. Uh, the only date on the Christian calendar that is devoted specifically to a theological concept rather than an event in the life of Christ or in Scripture. This is the only one. Some of you are going through the calendar now in your head. <laughs> I, I saw it happen. It, was, it, it moved. And, and, and yet, I think you won't find one. This is the one. Every other one has tied somehow to an event. This is, and, and it's tied to an event, that, something that we believe and we confess every week in the creeds when we affirm our faith. We'll do it again today. But it's a word itself that's not in Scripture, the word Trinity. But the church over time has stood firm on its belief that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that God exists as Holy Trinity. And, and so this is the day, having, having, having celebrated the incarnation, the coming of Christ at Christmas time. And having celebrated the resurrection and ascension of Christ at Easter time. And then having celebrated the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. What a good time to talk about the Trinity. <laughs> That's how it works. And I can do no better than I did three years ago. It's not the same sermon, but I, but I gave you this quote. I mean, who can get better on the Trinity than St. Athanasius, 4th century bishop? You've got to read it slowly. So settle in for just a moment to sort of savor Athanasius' words about the Trinity. We acknowledge the Trinity, holy and perfect, to consist of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In this Trinity, there is no intrusion of any alien element or of anything from outside nor is the Trinity a blend of creative and created being. It is a wholly creative and energizing reality, 
self-consistent and undivided in its active power. For the Father makes all things through the Word and in the Holy Spirit, and in this way the unity of the Holy Trinity is preserved. Accordingly, the church, in the church, one God is preached, one God who is above all things and through all things and in all things. God is above all things as Father, for God is principle and source. God is through all things through the Word, and God is in all things in the Holy Spirit. Whew. Now, we could spend a semester <laughs> talking about the Trinity and unpacking Athanasius, because that was just a paragraph, three or four sentences of Athanasius writing on this topic. But that's got a problem. The problem, of course, is that is that no matter what we say about God, it will of necessity be incomplete. I mean, Athanasius just said a lot. <laughs> and if you were actually listening, your mind was going, mm, mm, what did he say? What is that about? But whatever we say about God will of necessity be incomplete because God is that being beyond which no greater can be conceived. Trinity Sunday exists in this, in this creative tension, if you will, a creative tension between understanding all that we are able to understand based on what we affirm by faith to believe divine, to be divine revelation, and on the other hand, realizing that we can never fully understand because God is larger even than the revelation itself. crazy, isn't it? Don't go to sleep yet. I see some of the Theo nerds, eyes are brightening up. Some of the non-Theo nerds, are, eyelids are falling. <laughs> it's all right. But Trinity Sunday exists in that particular place. Today's passages certainly do give us, give us some glimpses of God, and perhaps that's the right way to think about what we can know about the Trinity whatever we know and believe we affirm are actually glimpses. They're not the full story. But our passages today certainly give us some glimpses of God in the language of confession. In Isaiah, we see a glimpse of God's holiness. It's the only time in Scripture where an attribute of God is repeated three times over. Holy, holy, holy. And in the face of the holiness of God, amidst the vision of the holiness of God, Isaiah, like we, are able to see something of our own unholiness, simply by contrast, by difference. And like Isaiah, we could experience, if we can grasp that vision, something of our own healing and our deepest calling. Here am I, send me. In Psalm 29, there's a, there's a glimpse of God's majesty. In, in, the, in the poetics of Psalm 29, a, a picture of, of God's uh, involvement in the created order, that the voice of God is over the created order in some way that God reigns majestic, the voice of God that thunders in and through and over all of the created order. In Romans 8, there's a glimpse of God's embrace. In Paul's articulation of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that, that embrace by which we are adopted into God's family as God's very own children. And then in John 3, we, we see a glimpse of, of God's mysterious presence and provision in Jesus Christ. Mysterious because you don't know where the wind blows. <laughs> Even though, even though we, in our orders of salvation, have pretty well made it the taxonomy. If you do these things, then this will happen. And yet, John is, Jesus is pretty clear to John. You don't know where the Spirit is moving. <laughs> the Spirit moves and does spirit things that are mysterious and bring God's presence. I love such glimpses. They're glorious. They're wonderful. 
But, but they're not so much about explaining God as they are about trying to capture the mystery of God. That God is bigger than our explanations. See, today is not a day for a course on the doctrine of the Trinity, which to me sounds very exciting. But rather, today is a day to bask in the wonder of a God that is beyond all of our understanding. I concur with what Anglican David Roseberry said when he said that all those analogies that we usually trot out on Trinity Sunday, at the end of the day, fall short. You know, we could talk about the three stages of water, or we could talk about the three parts of an egg, or we could talk about an apple, or we could talk even about the proverbial shamrock. And they might get you somewhere close to something, but they fall short. Perhaps it's better to think in terms of a metaphor, but even those don't quite get there. The Trinity, perhaps, is sort of like gravity. Gravity is this force that we cannot see or touch and much less fully explain. But, but we know it's there because we see and feel its effects. It's around us. It keeps us on the ground. It, it, it makes objects fall. And even though we cannot fully explain it, we do know that we cannot live without it. A normal life. So today on Trinity Sunday, it's really not so much a day about definition as it is a day about wonder. It's not so much a day about clarification as it is a day about adoration. It's, it's not so much a day for explanation as it is a day to get lost in glorification and wonder. It's not so much a day about understanding as it is about immersion. It's not about proclamation as much as it is about acclamation. It's not about clarity as much as it is about confession. Or to push it a little further, it's not so much about grasping the divine, perhaps, as it is about grasping our own humanity in the face of what we glimpse the divine to be. It's not so much about certainties as it is about the surrender of our life to one who is larger and more loving and more majestic and more good and more holy than we can imagine. Some years back, the neurologist, Dr. Oliver Sacks, wrote a fascinating vignette about an intriguing neurological difficulty that we know as Tourette's syndrome. As you know, Tourette's is a, is a disorder that causes its, its, uh, those who experience it to have any number of, of physical or verbal tics that are non-controllable. Some people with Tourette's have, have uh, facial twitches. Um, others find themselves uncontrollably uttering uh, verbal whoops or beeps or sometimes even raunchy swear words. One man that Dr. Sachs knew was given to a kind of a grotesque deep lunging and he couldn't control it, sort of a bows, bows forward and, a, and, a, and an uncontrollable readjusting of his glasses. And the thing was, this person that Dr. Sachs knew was a skilled surgeon. And Dr. Sachs writes in his vignette that somehow, unexplainably, this man who suffered with that kind of uh, huge sort of expression of Tourette syndrome 
when he would don his surgical mask and gown and enter the operating room, that all of his tics would miraculously disappear for the duration of the operation. Somehow he would lose himself so fully in that role and so totally that all of those odd quirks and glasses adjustments and shouts and bows were gone. Somehow, somehow don't you think that's how it is? when we are fully immersed in the presence of God. God who is holy, holy, holy. God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That finally, in those moments, and one day for eternity, we will finally be the selves we are created to be. Thanks be to God.